They look similar. They sound like Detroit. But only one became the working man's hero, and the other a mechanical nightmare wrapped in complications. Both engines came from the same factory and were built to get work done. One earned its name by showing up in places where uptime mattered most. The other built a reputation in the kinds of jobs that didn't tolerate weakness, but didn't reward complexity either. The 6V92 made its mark in American cities. Starting in the late 1970s and through the 80s and 90s, if you stepped onto a city bus in Chicago, LA, New York, or Dallas, odds are good that it was running a 6V92. Transit agencies leaned hard on these engines because they could take abuse. They idled in traffic for hours, climbed steep city routes, and restarted thousands of times a day. These engines worked through summers in Phoenix and winters in Minneapolis. When emissions rules tightened and fuel budgets got slashed, the 6V92 stayed in rotation because Detroit offered upgraded versions that met the new standards, and fleets could keep using the same basic platform without replacing their entire vehicle inventory. But it wasn't just buses. Fire departments liked the 6V92 because its smaller size left more room for things like larger pumps and plumbing setups. It also made engine access quicker when something went wrong. Municipal fleets put them into dump trucks, snow plows, and even street sweepers. Tow trucks ran them because they needed power in a package that could still fit under the hood. In the 1980s, if your vehicle had to stop and go all day on busy downtown streets or complete a suburban circuit, the 6V92 was on the shortlist. It was the go-to engine in places where the work never stopped, and you couldn't afford to wait on a tow. Now picture something entirely different, like dirt roads, steep inclines, remote job sites, and open water. That's where the 12V71 showed up. It powered the big stuff like trucks that crossed Alaska's haul roads, moving drilling rigs through snow and gravel, and log haulers on steep mountain grades with loads pushing 80,000 pounds. It was used in a variety of military vehicles, particularly during World War II. It powered American landing craft like LCVPs, LCMs, and LCIs, as well as armored vehicles such as M4A2 tanks and M10 tank destroyers, basically anything that needed non-stop torque under miserable conditions. It was bolted into massive pieces of mining equipment, tugboats pushing barges on the Mississippi, and standby generators that had to run entire hospitals when the grid failed. It wasn't an engine that slipped into a fleet unnoticed. When it started up, everyone around knew it. If the 6V92 was a daily workhorse, the 12V71 was a sledgehammer. Its users didn't always choose it because they wanted to. Sometimes, it was the only option strong enough to get the job done. It was never about comfort or convenience. You ran it because it was the only thing that could handle the job. Whether it was dragging a broken-down rig out of a mud pit or running non-stop in a remote camp with no backup, the 12V71 was the engine you counted on when nothing else was enough. Different work different expectations, and that's where the story really begins. The 6V92 was part of the 92 series that Detroit Diesel rolled out in the mid-1970s. It was designed to improve on the aging 71 series and to meet increasingly tough emission standards without reinventing the wheel. It kept the two-stroke layout and the same basic block architecture and service procedures mechanics we're already familiar with. But, under the hood, it was a different beast. At its core, the 6V92 was a V6 two-stroke diesel. Each cylinder displaced 92 cubic inches for a total displacement of 552 cubic inches. Most of the engines in the field were the TA variant, meaning turbocharged and aftercooled. They had become a staple in buses and vocational trucks. 
It used unit injectors with mechanical governors and Detroit's classic airbox breathing setup. What really made this engine work in the real world was its compact layout. This wasn't a massive engine, it was tight, and that made it fit in the rear compartments of transit buses, low cab forward fire trucks, and city rigs where space was at a premium. And mechanics liked that. It didn't require pulling a cab or removing half the bodywork just to get to the valve covers. It also had wet cylinder liners, something that made in-frame rebuilds a whole lot easier. Fleet mechanics could yank a piston and liner, replace worn parts, and have the engine back in service without pulling the block. That's a big deal when your garage is responsible for keeping dozens or hundreds of vehicles running. Compare that to a dry liner setup like the 71 Series, and it's easy to see why the 6V92 earned a loyal following. It wasn't perfect. And it had a tendency to leak oil because age and heat cycles often caused seals to harden and gaskets to fail over time. These were common weak points as the engines aged. Fuel economy wasn't great either, especially in turbocharged setups. But what it lacked in thrift, it made up for in reliability. These engines could take some abuse. High idle time, short hops, restarts all day, they kept going. And it was definitely loud. The 6V92 had the classic Detroit diesel scream. Not because it revved high, but because it was a two-stroke. People often thought it was redlining, when in reality it was just firing every stroke. Twice as often as a four-stroke. That gave it a sharp, almost frantic exhaust note that bounced off city buildings and echoed through traffic. To a mechanic, it was the sound of job security. To passengers, it was the sound of getting where they needed to go. Fleet operators appreciated how much of the engine was shared with other 92 series models. If you had a mix of 6 V92s, 8 V92s, you could stock fewer parts and simplify training. Everything from cylinder heads to injectors could often be swapped or serviced the same way. That meant faster turnarounds, fewer special tools, and more vehicles staying on the road where they belonged. In a way, the 6 V92 was more than just an engine. It was part of a system that made cities run. Its compact size, serviceable design, and shared components kept it in service well into the 2000s in some places, long after newer engines had been introduced. And that kind of staying power doesn't happen by accident. It happens when an engine earns its place one hard day at a time. The 12 V71 wasn't built for city buses. It was built for war, for wilderness, and for everything in between. Introduced in the late 1930s as part of the Detroit Diesel 71 series, this engine was designed long before emission standards or fuel economy dominated engineering decisions. The focus was on durability, torque, and serviceability under battlefield or backcountry conditions. With 12 cylinders arranged in a V configuration and 71 cubic inches per cylinder, it displaced a total of 852 cubic inches. Like its smaller siblings, it was a two-stroke diesel, using a gear-driven roots blower to scavenge air into the cylinders. Most versions were naturally aspirated, but turbocharged models did exist. The 12 V71T, for example, added a turbo to increase airflow and power output in high-altitude or high-load environments. Unlike the 92 series, the 71s used dry liners. This made the engine more robust in high-heat, heavy-duty cycles, but it also meant that in-frame rebuilds were harder and slower. That was fine in many of the roles this engine played, where downtime was rare and maintenance had to be done right the first time. It was not a quick-fix engine. If you were pulling a 12 V71, you were probably pulling it with a crane, it used mechanical unit injectors like the 6V92 and ran on a mechanical governor. No electronics, nothing to reset or recalibrate. The kind of simplicity that mattered when the nearest shop might be 200 miles away. The oil and cooling systems were oversized by design, meant to keep the engine alive in places where blowing a head gasket wasn't an inconvenience. It was a full-on emergency. This engine wasn't made for stop-and-go traffic. 
it was made to run for hours or days without rest. Like on a tugboat in a generator shack, or a logging skitter parked on the side of a mountain. It didn't care about comfort, it cared about torque. Peak torque could be reached at low RPMs, giving the engine serious grunt when it was needed most. And like the 6V92, the 12V71 had that signature Detroit sound, but deeper, more guttural. Less like a scream, more like a growl. What it lacked in grace, it made up for in guts. It was heavy, it was loud, and it was nearly impossible to kill. That earned it respect, but not necessarily affection. Mechanics knew what they were getting into when one rolled into the bay. You didn't open a service manual, you called for help. Still, for the jobs it was built for, there was nothing better. It kept oil rigs humming and kept convoys moving. It could power a crane one day and run a backup generator the next. It wasn't designed to be versatile. It just ended up that way. And even as other engines came and went, the 12V71 stuck around. In some corners of the world, it's still running when nothing else will. Because if you need to move something massive through something awful for a long time, the 12V71 is the one you trust to get it done. By the early 2000s, both engines were slipping out of service. The 6V92 stayed around longer in transit fleets and vocational trucks. The 12V71 faded more gradually from the toughest jobs, logging, mining, and maritime, where its strengths mattered more than the paperwork prohibiting it. But neither engine stood a chance against the tightening grip of emissions laws. Starting in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the EPA began phasing in Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 emission standards for off-road diesel engines. These rules aim to cut nitrogen oxide and particulate matter to levels that older two-strokes couldn't match. Both engines were inherently dirty. Their mechanical injectors, lack of exhaust treatment, and high oil consumption meant they smoked, they leaked, and they wouldn't pass any modern emissions test. Fleet managers faced a choice, retrofit or replace. For the 6V92, Retrofits included diesel particulate filters, electronic governors, or fuel timing adjustments. A few transit systems tried it, but the fixes were costly and the engine still ran rough compared to newer four-strokes. By 2010, most had been pulled, auctioned, or sold overseas. The 12V71 was rarely retrofitted. Its size, weight, and design made updates impractical. Some operators moved them into marine or stationary roles where emissions rules were more forgiving. Others sold them into international markets like Latin America, Africa, or Southeast Asia, where older engines still had a place. But in the U.S., since both engines were seeing restrictions, they could no longer be legally installed in new equipment. Replacement parts stayed available for a while, but even those started drying up as Detroit Diesel turned its focus to electronic four-strokes. Only off-road, legacy, or collector uses remained untouched by red tape. Replacing them wasn't simple. Fleets had to find engines that fit, not just physically, but operationally. The 6V92 gave way to the Cummins ISL, Detroit Series 50 and 60, and other electronically managed diesels that ran cleaner and used less fuel. The 12V71 was swapped for modern industrial diesels, CAT C-15s, Cummins Signature Series, MTU V-12s, engines that matched the torque but added diagnostics, emissions controls, and better fuel curves. Today, both engines have cult followings. You'll find six V-92s in restored MCI buses or classic fire trucks. Some folks convert them into RVs or use them in military surplus rebuilds. They're loud, smoky, and temperamental, but owners say there's nothing else like them. The 12V71 shows up in tractor pulls and equipment shows. Sometimes you'll hear one start up in a video just to make the ground shake. In a few places, remote islands, backup power shacks, and river barges, they're still earning their keep. 
but for the most part, they're retired. There are even stories, unconfirmed of course, of 12 V-71s still running pumps in the Venezuelan oil fields, or buried inside ancient tugs drifting through the Mekong Delta. Not because anyone loves them, but because nothing else will start in 120 degree heat after sitting for a year. Some of these engines ended up in museums, like the Detroit Historical Society, where a cutaway model of the 71 series still turns heads. Others went to training schools, where they were used to teach diesel fundamentals, but most found quieter second lives through to private collectors. Online, you'll find forums and YouTube channels dedicated to keeping them alive. Engine enthusiasts share rebuilds, part sources, and custom swaps. There's a small but passionate community around starting them up, just to hear that signature sound. Or bench testing them on homemade dynos for bragging rights. Rebuilt units sell for thousands. Even cores, rusted blocks pulled from fields, get picked up at auctions for restoration or display. Some engines even made their way into hot rods and rat rods, oddball builds where the engine is the centerpiece. A 6V92 swapped into a pickup. A 12V71 powering a land speed car, not practical, not quiet, but unforgettable. Meanwhile, parts are drying up. Cylinder kits, blower assemblies, and injection components are still out there, but they're getting harder to find. Some companies have started reproducing components, but it's slow going. Most owners rely on scavenging and swapping. The hobby is part mechanical know-how and part detective work. And while nobody's building fleets with these engines anymore, there's something to be said for a machine that decades later still sparks interest and still starts up with the right coaxing. In a world of diagnostics, deaf systems, and computers under every hood, these engines remind people of a time when steel, fuel, and determination were all you needed. That's not just nostalgia, that's legacy.